Welcome to the Forgotten Classics panel. We're able to be discussing uh, various uh, neglect, neglected works of the fantastic and um, uh, trying to uh, highlight those which are deserving of uh, revival uh, instead of merely having the merit of rarity and obscurity. Uh, I will introduce my panel starting with Farrah Mendelssohn. Would you like to say anything? Oh, yeah, okay. Um, I'm going to be talking mostly about children's fantasy today because I'm working on a, an introduction to children's fantasy literature. Um, can I also mention, though, um, I didn't have a chance to say I'm really hard of hearing. Make sure I can see. That's okay. My companion here is also very hard of hearing, right. so between the two of you, we'll manage. This could be interesting. And certainly when okay. it comes to questions, can people stand up? It makes it easier for me to lip read. Yes, very good. David. Uh, I'm David Hartwell. I'm a senior editor at Tor and have done a large number of anthologies, more than 40 but less than 50, I haven't counted recently. Uh, done particularly some very large fat anthologies on the history and development of various pieces of science fiction, fantasy, and horror. Uh, and I have moved 40,000 hardcover books from one house to another four hours away by hand in the last four years. <laughs> so you know your books intimately? I know my books physically. <laughs> I'm Robert Milton. I'm the moderator of the panel. I help David on occasion with his anthologies and I've read vast amounts of fantasy uh, uh, over the two century period and I've taken notes. He's older than he looks. Uh, that's also true. George. Introduce yourself to the audience. Hello, I'm George Nock. I'm probably the oldest person here. I specialise as a book dealer in antiquarian, science fiction, fantasy and that kind of thing. And my purpose here is to try and promote an, uh, an Australian author who made it very good in America in the early part of the century and nobody's ever heard of him these days. A chap called James Francis Dwyer who I think uh, when he's at the top of his form, he's uh, one of the best writers going. Cheers. Okay. Yeah. I'm at Paul Wilson. I'm, I'm us usually the oldest guy on the panel. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I have uh, a few seniors to me here now. Uh, but uh, I've been a, a voracious reader through uh, since the 50s, and I've read in many centuries and uh, so I've got some ideas of some people who uh, have been neglected, and uh, we'll get to those. Good. All right. Well, I guess, why don't we start with youth? Children's books, eh, Farrow? Yeah. And I realize I'm the only one who failed to explain what I actually do. <coughs> I'm a science fiction and fantasy critic. I happen to work on children's literature. I am not a children's literature critic. There is actually a difference which any children's literature critic would recognize in my work. You don't need to worry about that too much. Um, one of the chapters that has particularly entranced me is I've been doing a lot of work on British interwar fantasy. That's the period between uh, the First World War and the Second World War, so 1918 through to 1940. And it's interesting because it's marked by paper shortages at either time, so it's a really discrete period in a way that's not usually true. And what I started to notice was just how terribly experimental some of the children's fantasies that came out then were. But many of them just disappeared. And my first nomination for an interesting book that you have probably never heard of, although I know David will have done because he's read everything, is a book called The Hoosiers by Esther Bumfrey. Am I getting no. any recognition? No. Victory. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is a really strange little book. The Hoosiers are these not quite human creatures who are fascinated by humans. And one day, a little village in the outskirts is completely deserted because everybody has gone shopping. And the village decides to roll up its roads and turn in its little signs and hun hunker down. And the Hoosiers find the village asleep and decide to occupy the village. So I'm going to take my hearing aid out because it's picking up next door. Sorry about this. Um, and they, they take over the village, but they don't know quite how to use it. They don't know how humans really act. So they borrow a little girl called Lucy. And Lucy teaches them how to act. But this is where the book gets good. Because Lucy is a little girl. 
and she doesn't know how adults are, act. So all she knows is that daddies bring home bread and butter. Yes? So she separates the hujibas according to size, which is fun because some of the little ones have beards, and big ones are daddies, and little ones are mummies, and little ones are babies. And she sends the big ones into houses to make bread and butter, and the mummies she has sitting at home having cake, and the babies, with beards, remember, become little children. And this goes on for a while until the hujibas decide they don't, aren't actually enjoying it and rebel. And it sounds very simple, but it cuts across every single one of the other Toy Story type stories that I have from that period, where it seems to be, it, it seems like a, a small comment on imperialism that you can't teach people to be just like you, that even want, and, and the ending suggests that even wanting to be just like you isn't necessarily a correct thing. And it is beautifully told, and I actually think it might well be worth reprinting. It's still very funny, very amusing, and I've never come across it and can find no criticism on it. The author's name again? Esther Bumfrey. B O U M P H R E Y. Hmm. Well, I'm going to uh, mention a name that will probably be familiar to some in the audience, uh, but uh, has, is presently among the forgotten. John Collier. John Collier is one of the great short fiction writers of the 20th century, uh, who characteristically wrote in the fantastic. Uh, he wrote horror, he wrote fantasy. Uh, he wrote a couple of novels, but it's not the novels that he needs to be remembered for. His Monkey Wife is not a classic. Uh, however, his uh, Fancies and Good Nights, his, his major collection, sh should remain in print forever, as far as I'm concerned. It's, it's a marvelous book. And it was in print for decades and decades. Uh, people used to refer to him as a standard. Damon Knight said that uh, Avram Davidson is uh, so good a writer that he deserves comparison to John Collier. <laughs> uh, he was a standard of comparison, in other words, for the, for the mid and late century science fiction and fantasy writers. Uh, he was simply a model for everybody and far outside the, the you know, strict genre binders. Uh, so, John Collier is my first flag waving. Hmm. All right then. Uh, something I'm going to address is a humorous fantasy, although humor, of course, is a highly subjective thing, but there have been some very fine humorous fantasies that have fallen into uh, neglect. Uh, partly that's change in humor, and partly that's simply uh, the way publishing works. Uh, I can start with uh, a good Edwardian example. There was a uh, humorist who's a contemporary of uh, Barry Payne and F. Anstey. Now their weird and fantasy works have been revived frequently. This man's name is Frank Richardson. Uh, he wrote quite a bit on humorous pieces on mustaches. Uh, he seemed to find them absolutely hilarious. But um, <clears throat> in the fantasy vein, he wrote one of the more interesting um, sort of double headers. Uh, the Bayswater Miracle and there, there and Back. Now, he starts off with the very Anstean premise of a magic ring that causes personality exchange. And in this case, it's personality exchange between a young, proper young Edwardian man and his fiance. Now, the f one book deals with the misadventures of the man in the woman's body. The next book deals with the misadventures of the woman in the man's body. They operate on a parallel track, and it, it periodically intersect the action between the two books. And um, f they're quite well written, and fortunately, Frank Richardson is one of those Edwardian humorists who's actually, much of the time, really funny, which is always a good thing. Um, moving along into uh, the uh, post-World One, World War One period, uh, there's a man called Anthony, Ber uh, Anthony Berkeley Cox, and he's best known for his mysteries as Anthony Berkeley. He became very famous as a mystery writer and also wrote as Francis Isles, as I recall. But early in his career, he wrote a couple of interesting fantasies under the name A.B. Cox, and one of them is called The Family Witch, and the other is called The Professor on Pause. The Family Witch is what you'd expect. It's an ancestral witch who gets in various misadventures with her descendants. 
Professor on Paz, as I recall, is a scientist who's experimenting with, uh, not brain transplants, the weird tail sort of thing, but at any rate, I think he ends up transferring his personality into a cat, and uh, then has to work out how he's going to undo his own mischief. Uh, again, uh, these are quite funny. Cox had a real gift. In fact, in his early career, that's basically what he was, a humorist. Uh, before he hit his stride as a mystery writer. And uh, these are both well worth uh, looking uh, out for. And yes, I think they do have real merit uh, for uh, being uh, reprinted. Uh, and the last one, uh, move along another decade, and another mystery writer, Manning Coles, uh, under the name Francis Gate, the couple who worked as Manning Coles, wrote a sequence of sort of Thorn Smith like. Uh, humorous ghost novels. Uh, they go under the titles Come and Go, Brief Candles, and Happy Returns. Uh, two young men who got themselves into trouble during the Franco-Prussian War and got themselves killed. And their ghosts come back and continue to haunt uh, the place where they passed away. They have a very light tone. Uh, they're very funny and very amusing. There was a further one called The Far Traveler. That one, as I recall, is A Haunted Castle. And they go to shoot a film there, and the ghost has other ideas. These are all quite entertaining books, and uh, the humor holds up quite well. I believe, in fact, if I'm not, I think it was Rue Morgue Press reprinted the Francis Gates a few years back, but they slipped out of print again. And uh, that, however, will make it easier for members of the audience to look for these reprint editions. Again, they are worth pursuing. George. Well, I'm on a completely different tack here and trying to promote, without being able to say a lot about them, his work, an Australian writer called James Francis Dwyer. He was born in 1874 of um, Irish immigrant parents who emigrated to Australia. And one of his ancestors was what they, he refers to as a harper, who's a person who makes his living going around telling fiction stories to anybody who listens to him, so they give him a pint of beer or breakfast or something like that. And um, he developed, the, he had to try and develop the gift of a heart and probably without knowing him at first. And he spent a fairly rough life in the, in, in the Sydney area until the turn of the century when he and a couple of his pals were convicted of an attempted fraud and he spent three, three and a half years in jail. That was a horrifying experience, as one can imagine, and he had aspirations as a writer, but he wasn't given any paper or pencils on which to write. And he had to um, basically create the stories within his own mind, sort of refine them mentally, and um, eventually when he did emerge from uh, prison, he tried to make it as a writer of fiction in Australia and couldn't make it, so um, they didn't pay anything for him. So he emigrated to um, America in the, about the 1906, 1907, had a hard time of it for a couple of years. Then he, um, then he met the um, editor of a magazine that a lot of folk have heard of and very rarely seen called the, the Black Cat, edited in Boston. He published a lot of early fantasy, and um, in, uh, Francis Dwyer spent a couple of, uh, you know, about three or four months in this uh, editor's home, writing stories of the Black Cat by the dozen. He must have written about 50, he reckons. And then he went back to New York and started to sell to all the slick and the pulp magazines and made a great deal of money over the next 20 or 30 years until the outbreak of the Second World War. He had about a dozen books published, most of which are totally forgotten today. And if you look online for, for them, you'll probably only find The White Waterfall, which was his first novel, which was fairly successful. And after that, they just didn't sell. And he didn't write books much, simply because there was no money in it. He concentrated on magazines and he reckons to have written over a thousand stories. Now, a lot of these stories have elements, and some minor, some even major elements of fantasy, and occasionally science fiction in them. And uh, but I found a lot of his stories really excellent, and I tend to regard him as Australia's answer to Jack London. 
Um, <clears throat> we're going back to the oldest um, oldest books I, I've read that I think I don't think I, George uh, Chetwin Griffiths he wrote uh, a lot of Burnesque type of adventures back in the uh, turn of the century like 1898 I think Outdoors of the Air is his best known and it's um, basically it's, it was science fiction when he wrote it, but it's not science fiction anymore. He wrote about airships, uh, warships, dropping bombs from the air, um, and boats that could go 40 knots, and that was terribly fast at the time. But a lot of, most of his, his fiction was, uh, there was always an anarchist uh, who had the uh, advanced technology and would be attacking uh, civilization and trying to bring down governments and so they could take over as an anarchist. And ironically, I find myself rooting for the anarchist in, in these stories, which I don't think was his intent, but um, they're still very readable. Um, a, a lot of fiction from that time, I, 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 my eyes just glaze over trying to get through the, uh, the paragraphs, but his, his dialogue is, is fairly, it's, it's formal, but it, it's fairly snappy and, um, and fairly informative, so I, I found them still readable, and uh, they are fun. Uh, moving up, well here's, here's the thing, I, I, I do a lot of workshops with up-and-coming writers, or, or you know, writers who want to be, and I mention authors to them that they should know because it's in the genre that you know I'm, I'm doing these workshops and I get these blank stares and so I think there are a lot of more recent authors who are really forgotten. Um, Eric Frank Russell, if I mention Eric Frank Russell and I mention Dreadful Sanctuary, yeah, um, I get these blank looks. And, and I look around and I, and I go online and yeah, you, you can, if you really look, you can find Dreadful Sanctuary or you can find uh, Sinister Barrier, which, which originally appeared in Unknown Worlds. Um, these, are really, these are really nifty stories. They still hold up. Um, but again, he's somebody who's fairly recent, who has been forgotten. I mentioned Sprague de Camp to people. I get this blank look. I mean, the incomplete enchanter is, is one of the, one of the great fantasies, and it's just not being read. And um, I think that's some someone who could be promoted again and, and find a new audience because uh, those 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 don't get old. Those fantasies uh, like of, of the camps and and uh, uh, Eric Frank Russell is more on the science fiction side, but there you know there's definitely a fantastic element to it. So that's my nomination for the moment. I have more. I'll just throw in quickly. He also wrote good weirds. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I uh, am definitely on F. Paul's side. There are an awful lot of people who, uh, 30 years ago, would have been familiar to everybody, uh, but are being for, are in the process of being forgotten classics. The problem with Sprague's work was uh, that his very latest works, uh, his the works published in the last decade of his life, were really not up to the quality of his early work. Right, and this biased a lot of people. You know, if, if a writer gets old and goes downhill, <laughs> you know, well, you know, the, the early work must not have been very good either. Uh, but that's not the case. I think I've got to defend younger readers here. Although in this case, I'm not really one of them in the sense that I have read all those people. They don't. When you say they wear well, what you mean is that they still read well to you who comes from that shared culture. And I think that's absolutely legitimate. But I teach science fiction because I'm actually a historian. I teach historical science fiction. And first of all, I've learned you have to teach historical fiction or they often don't get the modern stuff. So you have to give them some kind of run-up. But it is noticeable that much of the culture that frames a lot of that older science fiction is completely alien to many younger readers. The funniest incident I had was when a neighbor a girl came to see me because she'd been asked to, to study Ray Bradbury's, I forgot the title right, The Murderer, the one where he kills Fridges. 
got this typia. It was on her A-level syllabus. And the basic story is that this guy is sick to death of being nagged by all the machinery around him, so he kills it. Okay? Straightforward enough. This was the A-level syllabus. It was only a few years ago. She could not get this story. It made no sense to her. I finally had to ask how her father felt about his mobile phone. Oh! <laughs> she's grown up in a culture where the fridge nags her. In some ways, she's the wife of the story. Her, she's not on the side the author is writing for. For her, for all that the science fiction is beautifully written, it's still a lovely story, it's one of my favourites. It doesn't grab, and it doesn't fit that cultural need. And one of the problems for science fiction is the very thing that makes it so exciting for us as readers, and for me as a historian, that it is very much attentive to its cultural moment. It, it, it's very much a part of that. Start losing that, and a perfectly good story can lose its traction with readers. Yeah, well, it also uh, comes back. I mean, if it's a good story, it comes back. Uh, and if it's a good writer, the writer comes back. Yeah, like, but, you know, um, in other words, with enough historical perspective, it doesn't matter that it's not of the moment. It doesn't matter that Shakespeare is not of the moment. It's still... An awful lot of Shakespeare yeah. doesn't work for young people. It well, indeed. Rather a lot yeah, of an awful lot of Shakespeare is, is, is terrible, as Ben Johnson said. But, uh, but, my but the good parts are really good. By the good. time you start enjoying Shakespeare, you're yeah. often being given a lot of the cultural context that helps make, it, make sense of it. And yeah. even then, right. different plays have had different resonances in different periods. Well, yeah, I, know I have an 11 year old daughter, and I'm teaching her contemporary culture by giving her the collected New Yorker cartoons, uh, which she has yeah. been reading over and over again, each time understanding more of them. Uh, but it brings you into the culture in a certain way, uh, but also brings you into adult culture, not merely kids' culture. Yeah, but some, some holds up. I mean, yeah, I think yeah. you're saying some, some are, are trapped in, in their little uh, bit of amber. Uh, of, the, of their time, mm -hmm. but I mean, I've been I've been working with uh, Henry Cutler stories uh, for, uh, and he's he seems to be forgotten too. There's another one you get the blanks there. You say Henry Cutler or Lewis Paget, but just um, make a movie of one of his stories. Oh yeah, the, the Mimsy. That's not yeah. forgotten then. But well, well no, nobody knows who wrote needed. the story. It was a rollout of, of, of the story with a nice flashy movie cover. Well, yeah, well, but a movie yeah. isn't uh, isn't reading. And uh, we're talking about reading. But it does um, raise an issue of why books. But his have. his um, uh, the Allegor stories still hold up as screwball comedies. And, and, and those of you who aren't familiar with them, it's, it's about this inventor who gets drunk, wakes up in the morning, and finds he's built something. And the whole story is trying to find out what the damn thing does. And there's half a dozen of them. And, and they're, they're all delightful screwball comedies, but they're all science fiction too. And I think they escape the, the, the time capsule type of thing because basically they're character driven of, of the guy who is trying to find out what he invented. What does it do? Yeah, and of course they're, they're, they're culturally removed from the moment right. because, uh, uh, for instance, uh, Gall uh, you know, Gallagher uh, you know, is a very serious alcoholic who gets blind drunk and can't remember what he did. Uh, okay, this let's is, start with the is, cultural this moments. Is, this is this. funny. Okay. Uh, no, seriously, this is exactly what I mean. Mm -hmm. My brother is 20 years younger than me. It's enough of a cultural shift to be dramatic. My younger brother has never built anything manually in his life before. Things come sealed in plastic, you open up, you damage the warranty. So the idea of building something, no, not part of his culture. He comes from a culture that increasingly doesn't think getting drunk is funny. Now, actually, he went through his student phrase of getting drunk, but you get sucked into prison if you drink and drive these days, you know? The kind of culture described in that doesn't have that same resonance. And I hit this really when I was working on kids' science fiction a few years ago, because there, I get very fed up with people talking about young adult novels as being more adult. In some ways, they're much less adult than the old juveniles. The old juveniles were aimed at kids who were leaving school between 15 and 17 who needed experience of the world of work. They're very workplace oriented. And those books talk about the skills you need. Most of the YA books, the only skill ever mentioned is how to date. 
Okay, and I mean that in all serious. I read 700 of these books. I know what I'm talking about. I read them too. You don't have to. Uh, and it's interesting that something that to you is so culturally neutral, I started to realize was very culturally not neutral. And to put bluntly, is why the engineering departments of Britain and America are full of PhD students from India, where it's still really useful to be able to fix your own lights and build your own well. Most British children in particular, I think America is a bit different, lack the kind of things that would give them that response to the inventor. Um, and, and I think it's actually really interesting to think about why stories disappear or die. Sometimes it's a cultural moment. Sometimes it can be a cultural moment in, encoded in a title that doesn't work. One of my other nominations, which I do hope someone's heard of, is Jean Ingelow's Mops of the Fairy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm getting a couple of nods this time. Mops of the Fairy. How many of you would buy this for your seven-year-old boy? With that title? This is a boy's book. This is about Jack, who finds three tiny little baby fairies, kisses one, sticks them all in his pocket, gets carried off by an albatross to fairyland, where he discovers that the one he's kissed has turned into a human star baby. And because he's kissed it and given it humanity, he has to look after it. And the book is shown with Jack looking after Mopsa and helping her grow up into a beautiful young woman who will eventually marry a fairy who looks just like Jack. Can you honestly imagine giving that to a seven-year-old boy today? Now, it's not that the boy wouldn't enjoy it, because actually he probably would, but it doesn't fit within our cultural construct of what we give boys to read. The notion of boyhood has changed dramatically. This book was written in 1869. It's roughly contemporaneous with George MacDonald's, um, oh, I forgot the title, Diamond? Oh, um, the the Princess and Luke. Thank you, I'm lousy at titles. Um, where we get this long description about how Diamond was terribly selfless and gentle and always obeyed his mother, quote, and was almost as good as a girl. This is not our world, you know? And it's that kind of thing that, however beautiful a book is, however lovely it is, how much we treasure it, can put it at, at variance with the cultural means. Well, is a good example of something, a book that was a classic for a very long time, and you're right, the shift finally took it away. And I was just going to say, uh, further to when I talked about Frank Richards, one of the interesting things was how sophisticated his gender ideas were for his period. It's one of the things that makes his books a little more interesting. He must have been a very interesting man, uh, because yes, uh, that can be a definite barrier uh, for uh, some of this older material. Hmm? No, no he's not. Bunter's a bit later. That would be John. Sorry. What sometimes happens is the book goes through a cycle where it goes completely out of fashion yeah. and then it becomes archaic kitsch. So it's noticeable that the Just Williams books become really popular again. Mm -hmm. Even though if any kid behaves like Just William these days, actually even if he behaved like that in those days but come from a working class family, he'd have ended up in care. You know, we don't tolerate that kind of behaviour from small boys anymore. But maybe it's because we don't tolerate it that we now think the books are cute. Oh, on the subject of uh, them, uh, I can riff on that because uh, Rich Mel Crompton wrote a very good collection of ghost stories yes. called Mist, and it's very much fallen into the completely forgotten area, but it is a very, it, it's got very solid material in it. She also wrote a pretty good horror novel called The House, about a haunted house, and they're both really remarkably good. They never got to be as well known as they ought to have been in their time, and both of them could stand reprinting. Yeah, I, 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 just for the fun of it, I'll turn this on its head. There, I, there are a couple of writers, I would say, uh, Horace Walpole's Hieroglyphic Tales uh, were published in an edition of five copies for his family during his <laughs> lifetime. Uh, and yeah. they were uh, nonsense fantasies in, in the mode of Lewis Carroll. Are those the ones that are full of fart jokes? No. I'm thinking <laughs> the wrong collection. No, they're not. This is... This is, this is uh, uh, just, just absolutely, they're, they're absolutely screwball, mm -hmm. uh, and they are actually nonsense logic mm -hmm. all through, uh, and they were, they were the kind of thing that would have been completely incomprehensible to his culture, <laughs> uh, yeah, or very right close, of course uh, and they, they didn't actually get published so that we could read them until the last 20 years. Uh, and 
uh, I've picked them up and used uh, some of them in, a, in anthologies. Uh, the, the whole history of, of, of 19th century uh, nonsense literature would have been different had these been published outside his family. Uh, yeah, they're rewriting the things. Um, yeah. A New Arabian Nights experiment. The young woman forced to marry an emperor and tell him stories all night, bores him to sleep with the narrative of the Council of Trent, and then she and the eunuch suffocate him in his sleep. <laughs> he may have been one of actually the first revisers of tales. I love this yeah. book, but believe me, there are fart jokes in this book. Um, a farting elephant, as I remember. Yeah. Uh, That's it, right. Yeah. It's the dice box, a fairy tale. And remember that this is all a parody. Translated from the French translation of the Countess of Donoir for the entertainment of Miss Caroline Campbell, but the child existed. This is a piece of nonsense, so this is just my notes, in which Pissy Missy left a pistachio nut shell coach and an elephant and the ladybird to draw it, goes on a series of adventures in which her main weapon is the ability of her elephant to break wind or drown towns with his dodgy, ta dodgy bowels. <laughs> and it ends with her marrying King Solomon. I knew I remember this. I told you, yeah, farting right. elephants. Yeah, right. That I one I didn't book. Right. It's wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. It really is. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was not really, not really forgotten, never known. It, it's only yeah. really been discovered yeah. recently. Yeah, it was reprinted a few years yeah. back, as I recall, in a nice slim little volume. Although, right. it could also be added that anybody who's read The Castle of Otranto understands that Walpole was no stranger to nonsense. Indeed, <laughs> indeed. Well, actually, was... My copy is re was reprinted yeah. in 1926, which yes. makes sense, actually, because, of course, that's Hilaire Belloc's period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The tales would appeal to that audience. Right. A lot of Gothic fiction was being revived at that time. I apologize for the database, but end note is your friend. Yeah. Uh, uh, the other person I'd like to mention is Lucy Sussex. I'm sorry, Lucy Clifford. Uh, mm -hmm. She was a, a, a major Victorian book reviewer. Uh, her husband, a mathematician, died young, uh, and she was a woman left in her 30s with two kids and no money, and she had to find a way to make money, uh, and so she became a book reviewer. <laughs> uh, uh, she also began to write children's stories and did like hack work and work for hire. Uh, published books, you know, under the, the initials LC. Uh, published stories in St. Nicholas Magazine and the name Lucy Clifford. Uh, the thing is that the best of these stories are superb. Uh, they are kind of children's horror stories. And they're uh, uh, very sophisticated. Uh, Portrayal, portrayals of, uh, for instance, uh, Wooden Tony is a story about a, a boy who wants to be very small and far away. Uh, and uh, it's kind of a, you know, a portrayal of childhood autism. Uh, very strange story. Very dis, you know, interesting fantasy. Uh, you know, The New Mother. Uh, is about uh, children who are seduced by what may be a demon uh, or a devilish character uh, into being bad. And because they are bad, mother has to leave and be replaced by a wooden autom uh, automaton with, you know, with glaring glass eyes and a wooden tail. Uh, and when this happens, the children are terrified and flee to the forest where they remain. <laughs> that actually raises another issue of why something can slip out of print. Um, yeah. This has become really obvious to me reading children's fa fantasy in chronological order, which is that what we expect the reader to do can shift. Yes. And The Other Mother is very much positioned as a warning tale. Now for most of the 18th and much of the 19th century, that's how children are being asked to read fiction. They're not being asked to read to identify, which is the, the thing we now take for granted. So that by the 1920s, that reading position has been moved on to the horror ghost story side. Mm -hmm. And in fact, what then we get in children's fiction that lasts well into the 60s is um, reading to emulate or admire, think, print, uh, think Peter in The Land, Witch and the Wardrobe. That I identification with mode is actually very recent indeed and seems to pick up in the 1970s. So if a story is written in a mode that is not comfortable for the reader, that asks the reader to take a different reading position, that can make a, a story just drop out of, of identification. I mean, an interesting shift, for example, 
is that it's quite clear that until relatively recently, two, two key things in children's fiction, you could write about children younger than the reader, and you could write about adults as the main protagonist. By the 1960s, that's gone from children's fiction. You have to have a child protagonist a couple of years older than the child, which I think underestimates the capacities and interests of children, actually. As far as I can see, kids want to know what adults are doing. But it's a quite dramatic shift, and I can't think what I was reading last week, where it became very obvious that although the expected reader was about 14, the protagonist was about 10. You wouldn't see that now. Hmm. Actually, it strikes me that this says something interesting about the current vogue for, dysto quote, dystopian mm -hmm. fiction. Uh, in children's literature today. Yeah, I was going to address a couple of darker fictions, actually, which are, they really are in the category of lost classics, the books that should not be much better known. Uh, one of them is Edwin, uh, Edgar Mittelholzer's My Bones and My Flute, which is an absolutely brilliant uh, ghost novel set in the jungle. Uh, the uh, spirit of a, uh, as I recall, a uh, dead Dutch colonist and his flute. And uh, the, uh, the haunting is handled in very interesting ways. It's a book that has an almost Conradian feel to it, but with a very nasty ghost embedded in the shadows of the underbrush there. And another uh, book uh, it was done just after the Second World War, and it periodically people will talk about it. Ethel Mannon's Lucifer and the Child, which is one of the most, one of the more interesting witchcraft novels. Very sophisticated book. Uh, young girl uh, attracted to the dark side of things and the dark stranger that seduces her. But their relationship is a very interesting dance. And uh, at, uh, initially there's sort of an ambiguity whether how much of the uh, diabolic is real and how much of it is her delusion. Although as it progresses, you get the stronger feeling that there's a definite whiff of sulfur off the pages. Yeah, can I possibly add one thing to what I said about James Francis Dwyer? He actually published his autobiography in Australia in 1949. It's called Leg Irons of Wings, a very peculiar title, but it was suggested to him by his old friend Abraham Merritt. Uh, George mentioned uh, uh, A. Merritt. Uh, he's someone who really is not readable uh, these days. Uh, I've, I've gone back and looked at uh, the moon pool, and here's a guy who never met an adjective he didn't love. And it, it, the, uh, the prose, is, 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 they're mostly lost race stories. I, and if you're going to read a lost race, I, I would say go back and read H. Ryder Haggard. Um, I, I don't think you can, anyone can appreciate Indiana Jones unless they know Alan Quartermain. Um, and she, and, he, and you, you read Haggard and you realize that this is where uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs uh, was inspired. And so was, uh, so was uh, Robert E. Howard. Um, so, so as I would say, I would prefer if, if anyone's going to read back in that period, I would say, H. Ryder Haggard would, would be a better better choice, just for the resonance he has down through the um, more than a century, um, almost two centuries, uh, uh, the influence that, uh, of his shadow uh, to on, on what we're seeing in movies and uh, what was written in the, in the 30s and 40s. And uh, to go over to George Griffiths we were talking about, yes. a couple of is that early novels, The Angel of the Revolution, were bestsellers in their day. They even inspired H.G. Wells. But the great thing about him, in some respects, is he did not like America. And that his anti-American styles came over so well in some of his novels that virtually none of them were published in the United States. None of the forty, only about one of them, I think, called The Lake of Gold, appeared over there. And so he never managed to make it in America simply because he was a little bit anti-American. A lot of the writers we've mentioned, uh, of course, they fall in the category of people who were famous, but uh, time has not been kind to them. And some of the names we've mentioned are really quite obscure. Every so often you will get a very famous writer uh, 
who writes a completely forgotten, fan largely forgotten fantasy. And uh, the one I'm going to mention is J.M. Barry. Everybody knows Peter Pan, everybody still remembers, but no one remembers Farewell Miss Julie Logan, his late ghost story. And actually, ghost story perhaps isn't quite the right word. Is it a ghost story? Or is it a vampire story? It's one of these stories that's really quite interestingly uh, and intriguingly uh, ambiguous. Uh, you're never quite sure what Julie Logan is. Is she a fae? Is she a vampiress? Um, what is actually going on? The hero has some trouble grasping this as well. And uh, it's a very interesting and subtle piece. It's a piece that Robertson Davies greatly admired. He thought it was one of the best supernatural novellas of the 20th century. But it's uh, a book very few people seem to have heard of. Yeah, well, of course, Barry, we don't generally mention drama, but Barry was a dramatist, and he wrote a number of fantasy plays, which were very popular in his day. Mary Rose is a very good time slip piece. Yeah. And now I think we're going to open it up to the audience, because I think the young man's going to come and remind us. Yes. Yes, Ramsey. Well, just two comments. I think one very straightforward is that Hitchcock, at the very end of his career, proposed to make Mary Rose. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is, Anthony Burgess actually entered into the major collection of probably his short stories, did he not? Yes, he did. Yeah, he was another one to look out for. Yeah, and they did his version right. of, uh, they published his uh, script for Paradise Lost, which is an interesting document in its own right. Yes. Yes. Now, there are several different uh, and, uh, Collier collections that you can find. Uh, Fancies and Good Nights was kind of the standard one yeah. for decades. Oh, okay. Yes. I wanted to mention Margaret Irwin, who's yes. possibly still known as a yeah. historical novelist, but mm -hmm. wrote, well, I think, two very good fantasies. Mm -hmm. One is Still She Wished for Company. Mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. a time slip novel. And it's fascinating now, partly because it starts in the 1920s when it was written and slips back to the 18th century. And evokes, I think, for, for us now, both the, the period just after the First World War, very interestingly, as well as um, a very different 18th century society. And she also wrote a book called These Mortals, mm -hmm. which is a fairy tale. Um, and um, again comes from that period in the 1920s when uh, people, I think, were much more experimental about fantasy than the kind of realist literary tradition allows for. I'm very glad you mentioned those. It saved me the trouble of doing so. <laughs> yes? Uh, uh, one comment is that I think the average age of the screen is well above 40. <laughs> shows you who's interested in this kind of thing, but uh, my, mine is uh, Cubans, The Other Side. I don't know if anybody's read this. Yes, it's, uh, yes. Early 19th century, I think. Uh, surrealist, the most novel. Yeah, Daedalus published a very good translation yeah. by Mike Mitchell. Yes. Yeah. Um, about a man who goes on a journey to a very strange country run by an autocratic ruler who changes not only the laws, but uh, rules, but the laws of physics even. Mm -hmm. what happens in the world. And Cuban also has uh, incredible illustrations as well, which are a kind of um, Odeon Redon sort of, uh, in, that, in that kind of genre, very, very worthwhile. He also did some marvellous illustrations of Poe, very suited. Uh, you said that some book, some novels and uh, stories have good reason to run out of print. Okay. How would you feel uh, if some author was commissioned to readjust them to current reality, to adapt them. Oh, I have such mixed feelings. I really do. I mean, in Britain, the single most controversial author on this basis is a woman called Enid Blyton. I'm assuming I'm going to see nods from the Brits. She wrote great adventures for kids, but they are riddled with classism, and, and that would be difficult to alter. But they are also full of casual racism that would be very easy to alter. So in fact, one of the books I thought of bringing up was Eni Blyton's The Wishing Chair, which is lovely. These two children find a chair that flies, and they go off with a little gnome, and they have adventures. The gnome is called Chinky. Okay, I hope I'm getting some flinches here. Is it worth changing the name of Chinky? Yes, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> 
is it worth rewriting the books to get rid of all the classicism and embedded? The racism tends to be quite literally named superficial. No, they wouldn't be any Blythe's books anymore. Write something else. Write something that captures her joy de vivre. Be an independent author. So, the occasional tweak, I'm fairly cool with. Oh, the other problem in one of her books is that the child is called Fanny. Actually, not so bad now, but a major problem in the 70s. <laughs> yeah, if all it takes is a little tweak, just do it. Stop arguing. But you can't rewrite a book to remove the fundamental ideologies of that book without doing serious violence to the book itself, our notions of literature, our understandings of how smart kids are. Yeah, um, I was going to say, you just can't take the anti-Semitism, etc., out of Lovecraft. Yeah. You, know, yes. you just have to leave Lovecraft alone. <laughs> right, we can take another. Yes, Al. Yeah, uh, this is for you. Uh, who wrote the collection The Mist? Richmond Crompton. Who wrote the just Crompton. Yeah, Crompton. And I suppose I should just throw in as a make way. Uh, she had a talented, uh, her brother, John Lamborn, was a talented writer, and he wrote uh, really a very good uh, sort of, I suppose we'd call it a were vampire story set in Africa called The Unmeasured Place with a very sympathetic femme fatale. Yes. Uh, it's a book that's well worth looking for, and that, I'm afraid, wraps us up. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope you enjoy.